Okay, everyone. Um, it's past 3.30, so it's probably a good time to get started. Um, very happy to introduce Dr. Joseph Dwyer. Uh, he received his PhD in physics from the University of Chicago in 1994. He's been working on cosmic ray astrophysics there. Uh, he was a research scientist in gamma ray astronomy and space physics at Columbia University and also spent some time at the University of Maryland, College Park, uh, before joining the faculty at Florida Tech. Um, there he served as chair before moving to the physics department um, at, and the Space Science Center at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, where he is now. He works on uh, many topics, including terrestrial gamma ray flashes, terrestrial electron beams in the inner magnetosphere, x rays from laboratory sparks, uh, relativistic feedback charges, also known as dark lightning, um, and he helped establish the field of high energy atmospheric physics. So we're very happy to have him here today to tell us about gamma ray emission from thunderstorms and dark lightning. All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to tell you about my research. So let me start off by saying a little bit about lightning. So these are sort of some gee whiz facts about lightning. So lightning strikes the earth about four million times every day. There's thunderstorms going around on around the world all the time. Uh, we get a lot of lightning in the United States, but there are other places we get lightning as well, Africa, South, South America. Uh, in the United States, lightning causes somewhere between four and five billion dollars in losses and damages every year. People get their houses burnt down, uh, disruptions to power plants, um, airlines have a lot of trouble with lightning, and so on and so on. That adds up to about four or five billion dollars, so it's a big problem. And then lightning also kills and hurts a lot of people around the world on average, lightning kills more people than either hurricanes or tornadoes. So uh, a lot of people are really afraid of these, but year after year, these cause more damage. Lightning is also a big mystery uh, from the point of view of a scientist. Um, we really don't know a lot of the basic things about how lightning works. Now, we're good at saying what lightning does. We can say how many times lightning strikes the planet. We can, t I could tell you, you know, what the temperature of lightning is. I can tell you some of the basic properties, but I would really have a hard time telling you how it did those things. So uh, we're good at the sort of answering the what it does kind of questions, but not so good with the how questions. Of course, as physicists, we want, that's what we want answers. How does it do it? So for example, we really don't under understand very well how thunderstorms charge up and produce the strong electric fields, what kind of electric fields are present inside thunderstorms. We don't have a good handle on that. We don't understand at all how lightning gets started inside thunderstorms. So decades of measuring electric fields inside thunderstorms have never found a field big enough to actually make a spark. And yet we get four uh, million of these things produced inside thunderstorms every day. So that's called the lightning initiation problem. It's probably one of the biggest mysteries in the atmospheric sciences. After it gets started, lightning can travel hundreds of miles through thunderstorm systems, and it's about as wide as your finger. So somehow it breaks down the air in front of it, makes it a conductor, carries that current along the channel, transports charge to the end. Somehow it manages to do all this, and yet we really don't understand how it does it. We really don't understand the basic picture of how it does all that. Uh, so there's a lot we don't understand about lightning. These are very simple questions. How does it get started? How does it move? And we're just still starting to answer those. There's also a lot of very unusual things that happen in our atmosphere. I think we're really just still exploring our atmosphere. We haven't figured out everything that's going on. And to illustrate this, I want to show you this photograph. So this is a, a picture taken by a friend of mine, Steve Cummer at Duke, and this is a photograph of a sprite. So this is an electrical discharge above thunderstorms. So a thunderstorm will produce lightning, and in response, you'll get this electrical discharge above the storm that goes right up to the edge of space. So the top, uh, the top of this is at the lower edge of the ionosphere. That's probably about 80 kilometers up. And to give you an idea how big this is, that is how the full moon would look compared to the sprite from one end of the state of Kansas to the other. So if this, you were one end of Kansas, the sprite was above a thunderstorm at the other end of Kansas, you looked up, this is how big it would look compared to the full moon. These are bright enough to see, and nobody knew they were there until 1990. 
Okay, so we got these monsters up in the air, and we didn't know that, that they were there until just relatively recently. So if we can miss something like this, something this spectacular, what else is up there that we are missing? So another thing that we realize is up there are these. So this is a terrestrial gamma ray flash, or TGF. So I'm going to say TGF, TGF, TGF throughout this talk, and I'm probably gonna forget to say terrestrial gamma ray flash too many more times. So I'll say it one more time. Terrestrial gamma ray flash, TGF. So this is a burst of gamma rays coming up from the Earth's atmosphere. So what happened is back in the uh, early 90s, um, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, one of the great observatories, was launched and was started taking data. And this was, there's an instrument on board called BATSI. And the BATSI was designed to figure out where cosmic gamma ray flashes come from. So these are big bursts of gamma rays that come from outer space. For a long time, people thought they were coming from neutron stars in our galaxy. Turns out they're cosmological distances, really cool stuff. That's what this was designed to study, was these flashes from space. So they sent this thing up, they turned it on, and yes, they started seeing cosmic gamma ray flashes, but every once in a while, they would see a flash of gamma rays coming from exactly the wrong direction coming from the one place in the universe you, they knew that there should be no gamma rays coming from, coming up from the Earth's atmosphere. And this, is, this shows what one of these looks like. So this is on a time scale of milliseconds. So this is very short, much shorter than the time scale for cosmic gamma ray flashes. And it's very bright, and this shows the counts in the detector. So very short, very bright flash, and they have these detectors spread out around the spacecraft so they could tell it was coming up from the Earth. Now, this was very strange, and they really didn't know what was happening, where these were coming from, and so they asked themselves, well, where do they come from? And initially, they guessed, well, I should say, so they first they figured out that these were loosely associated with where the thunderstorms were. So they knew they were coming up from the Earth. They could look at where the spacecraft was at the time they saw these gamma ray flashes from low Earth orbit. And they could look at what was below. And they realized that what was below was, were thunderstorms. And uh, so they, they, see the, they saw these in the same places there were thunderstorms, and sometimes there were thunderstorms actually going on at the time of these terrestrial gamma ray flashes. And so they said, well, what about thunderstorms could be producing these uh, terrestrial gamma ray flashes? And just a couple years before, there's a sprite. These sprites were discovered. And they're so big and cool and spectacular, they have to be doing something interesting, right? So they must be the source of these uh, terrestrial gamma ray flashes. Another reason that they thought this was gamma rays don't go that far through the atmosphere. That's why they put the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory up in space to see things from space. Gamma rays attenuate very rapidly through the atmosphere. So if you're seeing something coming up through the atmosphere, it's logical that it must have been emitted near the top of the atmosphere rather than deep down, just simply from the gamma ray attenuation. So everyone knew that sprites were somehow producing these big bursts of gamma rays. And there was an entire industry, theoreticians were really busy, they published lots and lots of papers modeling sprites as the source of the terrestrial gamma ray flashes. In fact, they turned it around and the terrestrial gamma ray flashes were actually making the sprites. And so everybody knew this, and you read review papers, and the amount of certainty in this is, is really impressive. They just knew that terrestrial gamma ray flashes came from sprites. Well, that all changed in 2005. The source altitude came crashing down uh, to thunderstorms, and we now know that these things have nothing to do with terrestrial gamma ray flashes. In fact, many things in the atmosphere make gamma rays except sprites. Sprites seem to be one of the few things in the atmosphere that actually have nothing to do with gamma ray emission. So we now know that thunderstorms are the source of these things, and I'm gonna be telling you why we know that in just a little bit. But let me first show you an artist's impression of what one of these terrestrial gamma ray flashes would look like if you could see gamma rays, maybe like super, if you're a superman and could see x-rays and gamma rays, what would you see? Uh, so this, the pink here shows uh, the, this is actually from a Monte Carlo simulation. So this is from a real physics simulation. And this is showing you have a thunderstorm source and this is sort of what you would see as the gamma rays come up and out of the atmosphere. 
Now, it's kind of an amusing story around this. Um, a few years ago, we discovered something about terrestrial gamma ray flashes, and NASA wanted to do a press release. And so they wanted a nice image of a terrestrial gamma ray flash and asked if I could put together something. So I had a Monte Carlo simulation. And so I ran it and, um, and made, you know, sort of fiddled with it and made it look nice. And of course, you always have a choice of what color. You can't see gamma rays, so you can pick any color you want for the gamma rays. And so I wanted to make it look really cool. So I, I made it like a deep burning red, looked like lava shooting up. It was really cool looking. And I sent it in to NASA, and they looked at it and said, that's nice, but no, gamma rays are pink. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> No, gamma rays are pink, and they were very insistent upon this. It turns out there is an official gamma ray color of NASA, and that's it. <laughs> now, ironically, so I changed it. It didn't look as cool. Now it looks like a big pink flower. And ironically, I so they, this was this the press release went out, and someone in the art museum at Brevard County saw this and looked so, thought it looked so pretty, they did an entire show centered around this, the art of science. And so I've actually got more mileage out of this one flower than just about anything I've ever done. Okay, so let me summarize a few facts about terrestrial gamma ray flashes. So some of the things we know about them. So in a time scale of maybe 100 microseconds, a thunderstorm somehow manages to make somewhere between 10 to the 17 and 10 to the 19 high energy MeV electrons. Uh, it can happen as few as 10 microseconds. So lots and lots of high energy electrons are being produced in a very short time period. The average energy of these electrons is 7 MeV, and they, they can extend up to maybe 50 MeV. So very energetic stuff. We know that they're associated with intercloud lightning, so lightning that stays inside the thunderstorm as it goes up within the thunderstorm. Somehow, when lightning is doing that, it, it makes these terrestrial gamma ray flashes. These terrestrial gamma ray flashes also produce some of the largest radio emission from thunderstorms on the planet. So you can also measure lightning in radio waves, and you'll see, I mean, if you ever have an AM radio on, there's a thunderstorm, you can actually hear the lightning crackle. So lightning emits a lot of radio radio waves, the, some of the most powerful radio waves emitted on the planet from thunderstorms are from these terrestrial gamma ray flashes. There's so many charged particles flying through the thunderstorm. They produce so much ionization that you get very large current pulses and lots of radio waves. Uh, so these are the things we know that it does, but it's very challenging to figure out how you get so many high energy electrons generated by a thunderstorm deep in the atmosphere in such a short time. So here's a piece that we think is going on. So this is a little snapshot of a Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo simulations, you put in all the physics and you try to, you try to simulate particles as they would really move. And so this has all the important physics. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a home-built Monte Carlo code, but it's similar to something like Jayant. So if you imagine a piece of air here, and you inject 125 MeV electron. So that, that could be from a cosmic ray. In fact, there's, you know, as I'm speaking now, there's plenty of these electrons flying through the room right now. So they're not rare. You imagine just one of them. You inject it here and watch what happens. Well, as it moves through the air, it's going to ionize the air, and it's going to lose energy. And so it's going to slow down. It's going to sort of scatter around, straggle around, and eventually come to a stop as it loses all its energy. So it came after about 75 meters, it came to a stop, and it was absorbed. You also notice this sort of hair on the track. These are the so-called knock-on electrons. They're also called, for detector physics, they're called delta rays. These are just electrons that were in atoms that got kicked out of the atoms as the particle went through. So particle goes by an atom, it interacts, it scatters, and out comes a secondary electron, has a little bit of energy, not quite as much, and so they go some distance before they're, they lose their energy and are absorbed as well. So nothing very exciting here, nothing uh, terribly unexpected. So now I'm going to do the same simulation again, but I'm going to put in an electric field. Yes? Sorry, 
simulation? Yes, this is a Monte Carlo simulation. And I'm going to show you another Monte Carlo simulation, the exact same simulation. The only difference is I'm going to add an electric field, the kind of electric field that you would actually see inside a thunderstorm, the kind that has been measured inside thunderstorms. So this is what the picture looks like now. Same electron injected at the top, but now instead of stopping after 75 meters, it continues to gain energy from the electric field and exits the bottom. Now remember that, that uh, hair on the track, those uh, knock-on electrons? Now look what happens to them. Rather than stopping after a meter or so, they gain energy from the electric field and move out the bottom, and they can produce additional secondary electrons, which also accelerate. So for the price of one electron at the top, we have what, one, two, three, four, five exiting the bottom. This is an avalanche multiplication. And this is after 150 meters. Thunderstorms are big places. The electric field can extend for miles. And so every 150 meters, you get times five uh, more of these energetic electrons. So by the time you get to the bottom of the, the thunderstorm electric field, you can have a very large number of these. So this process, this is called, and I've got a little arrow to show it. This process is called Relativistic Runway Electron Avalanche Multiplication, or RIA. And this was introduced in 1992 by Gurevich and others. So this is thought to be one of the main building blocks in how you make energetic radiation, uh, X-rays and gamma rays coming out of thunderstorms is by these electrons accelerating in strong electric fields, yeah? So what about the effect of the Earth's magnetic field um, at these high speeds? Do you there is a, there is a, yes, so if you put in the Earth's magnetic field and watch how this avalanche would develop, you would, no, you would notice it um, going off to the side a little bit as it's, as from the Lorentz force as they're deflected a little bit. It's not, it's a small deflection. You can barely see it at thunderstorm altitude, but when you get above about 40 kilometers, then the story changes. Then the electrons will start following the field line. And I'll show you an example in a little bit where you can actually see that. So the basic idea of these runaway electrons, I mean, just show a little bit of details here. So this shows how an electron loses energy in air versus its kinetic energy. So this is the energy of an electron, and this shows, think of it as the drag force, how quickly it loses energy. And this curve right here, the dark one, is from ionization. And if you include Bremsstrahlen, the X-ray emission, this is the, from the Bremsstrahlen losses here. This part of the curve is actually, it's the famous beta block uh, energy loss curve. The um, very well known in physics, particles here are minimum ionizing, and this is the relativistic rise. So this is a really well known curve. If you plot the electric field here, so this is the rate that you gain energy from the field, this is the rate that you lose energy, so whenever the straight line here is above this curve here, an electron will gain energy from the field. So this will work as long as you start off a little bit energetic. So if you start off with this energy, you'll continue to run away up to very large energies. So you can visualize this with this plot. And so I'm showing a piece of air. This is showing an avalanche over 60 meters. And this is showing the energy of the electron. So I'm going to inject one electron here at 100 keV. It's going to gain energy in the electric field. These little dips here are hard scatters, either from molar scattering or Bremsstrahlen. And the electron will gain energy on up here. And then here are the secondary electrons that then gain energy. And you get more and more and more. So this is the avalanche process you're seeing. They're all gaining energy as they go that way, and you're getting more and more. These blue traces here are actually positrons. So as these electrons move through air, they emit X-rays, technically X-rays, but we can call them gamma rays because they're up in the multi-MeV range. So you have multi-MeV gamma rays being produced all the time as the electrons bump into air atoms. Those gamma rays at this energy, one of their favorite ways of interacting with air is pair producing, which produces electrons and positrons. The positrons can turn around, they're energetic, and run away in the opposite direction, same principle and the positrons end up back here. So more on the positrons in a few minutes. So you can produce a lot of 
high energy radiation, as long as you have a source of the seed particles. So remember, you need a particle that's already a little bit energetic to get the whole thing going. So here I injected one 100 keV electron, and that was enough to get the whole avalanche going. So the problem now becomes what's the source of these energetic seed particles, which then allows you to do this avalanche multiplication. One source could be cosmic rays. I mentioned cosmic rays already. If you had a cosmic ray air shower going through a high field region in the thunderstorm, that can produce a lot of secondary particles, which could then accelerate in the field, and you get, um, you get a lot of electrons. So these show the energetic electrons, and they make the gamma rays, which then would be the terrestrial gamma ray flash. Turns out when you consider this mechanism, you don't get enough runaway electrons. In fact, the number of electrons I plot here is 10 to the 14 times too few to be a TGF. So a TGF, you have to multiply the number of trajectories here by 10 to the 14. Okay, and a cosmic ray, just there are not enough seeds to give you the number of electrons that you need. So cosmic rays can illustrate how the process works, but it can't explain the terrestrial gamma ray flashes. They're just too bright. So there must be some other mechanism. And I'll, in a minute, I'll show you what those might be. But let me, since now I, I sort of explained the avalanche multiplication, let me show you some uh, impl what this implies. So we can look at how many electrons we expect to see and how many gamma rays we expect to see versus energy in this avalanche. So this is a, uh, this shows a plot of the energy spectrum of the gamma rays coming out of a terrestrial gamma ray flash predicted by a model and compared to spacecraft observations. So running this Monte Carlo simulation, I can produce these theoretical curves and the only difference in the curves is how much atmosphere is between the spacecraft in low Earth orbit and the thunderstorm source. And as you go down in atmosphere, if you go down deeper in the atmosphere, the uh, spectrum flattens. The, um, the uh, diamonds here are data from the RESI spacecraft. This was a, this was a spacecraft uh, built, it was designed to study solar flares and things like that from the sun, has uh, large germanium detectors and the terrestrial gamma ray flashes are so bright they come right in through the back of the spacecraft and light up the germanium detectors. And so this is data from RESI and these are FITs. And just from looking at this, just by eye you can see that it must be a deep source. There's a, there's a lot of atmosphere between the source and the spacecraft, and just with even by eye, you can tell that sprites are not the source of terrestrial gamma ray flashes looking at the RESI data. So, doing model fits, we can see that actually the range um, of, uh, of altitudes that best fits this is down at thunderstorm level. So, this was actually the first indication that thunderstorms and not sprites are the source of terrestrial gamma ray flashes, and we do that by studying the spectrum of the runaway electrons. Okay, so at this point we realize, based upon RESI data, that terrestrial gamma ray flashes are coming from deep in the atmosphere from thunderstorms. So we thought we we're kind of patting ourselves on the back at this point, thinking, you know, good job, we figured out where these are coming from. They're coming from thunderstorms. And then we saw this. So this is another RESI event. And this is where the spacecraft was when it saw a terrestrial gamma ray flash, a fairly bright one. And it was over the middle of the Sahara Desert on a bright sunny day without a thunderstorm within a thousand miles. And if the source of terrestrial gamma ray flashes was sprites, then there's no problem getting electrons up into space. And you can think, well, maybe they're following the geomagnetic field line. But how can you get particles, electrons into space if it's a thunderstorm source? So this really confused us for a long time. And we finally, I think, we finally figured out what the answer is. I'm going to tell you what it is, but let me show you something really interesting. So these uh, triangles show where all the lightning was at the time of, around the time that we saw this terrestrial gamma ray flash here. And if you come down here, if you follow the geomagnetic field line that goes through the spacecraft and trace it down to the conjugate point, that's where that square is. So that square lands right on top of a thunderstorm. 
So there was no thunderstorm below the spacecraft, but following the geomagnetic field line, there was a thunderstorm at the far foot point. So here's what we think is happening with this. So imagine above the thunderstorm. So here's that little avalanche I showed you. It's making lots of uh, x-rays and gamma rays, and here they're pink again. And all the pink here is the gamma rays coming up through the atmosphere, scattering around. This is showing about 200 kilometers of atmosphere above the thunderstorm. Now as these gamma rays scatter up and out of the atmosphere, they produce secondary electrons, Compton electrons, um, um, photoelectrons, and also pair production. So you get lots of secondary electrons as these gamma rays scatter up through the atmosphere. Now if you're down deep, there's a lot of scatters, uh, and you can see there's a lot of secondary electrons made, but they're deep enough in the atmosphere they don't go anywhere. They just get reabsorbed because there's no big field above the thunderstorm. But when you get to about 50 kilometers, there's still enough atmosphere to scatter the gamma rays and produce secondary energetic electrons, but there's not so much to stop them. So these secondary electrons made by the terrestrial gamma ray flash spiral along the geomagnetic field line and go up and out into space. So you get a beam of electrons, and actually there's a lot of positrons in that beam too. So you get a beam of these secondary electrons and positrons that can then go up into space following the geomagnetic field line. And you can, this is back to that artist impression. So this sort of shows what it looks like as the electrons in yellow and the positrons in green follow the geomagnetic field line up and out. And these will go on for a thousand or so, 2,000 miles. Meanwhile, the gamma rays are local above the thunderstorm, but these can go a long ways away. Other spacecraft have seen these since, and we name these terrestrial gamma, terrestrial electron beams. And uh, you can sort of see the picture here. This is data from the Fermi spacecraft. It saw another one of these events above the Sahara Desert. Here's where the spacecraft was. Here's the Earth in cross-section. This shows the geomagnetic field line. There was a thunderstorm and lightning down here, so there's a terrestrial gamma ray flash here. It made the electrons and positrons, which follow the geomagnetic field line around, hit the spacecraft, and that's what caused this first um, spike in counts. These are the electrons and positrons as they whack the spacecraft, and they get spread out because of the pitch angle, the spread and pitch angles of the particles. Now, as these, not all these particles hit the spacecraft, some of them go past, then they magnetic mirror in the stronger field, and then come back and hit the spacecraft a second time, and that is the mirror pulse right there. So you can see, this can be modeled very simply just by knowing the, geo, uh, the configuration of the geomagnetic field that uniquely determines those two points. And also, the uh, spacecraft lit up in 511, so there was a lot of positrons in the beam. So this was an electron-positron beam that hit the spacecraft. Spacecraft. So this is a second phenomenon. This is um, terrestrial electron beams, a new source of energetic particles in the inner magnetosphere that was just figured out a few years ago. Okay, so all that is thunderstorms, what's happening above thunderstorms. So what about lightning? So what's going on with lightning? Is it doing anything interesting? Now, when I first got into this business, I was, this is, this is back around 2001, I was, uh, I was a young assistant professor at Florida Tech, and I was looking for something to do with the students, and so I knew how to make x-ray detectors. I had been doing gamma ray astronomy and, and energetic particle measurements, and I was looking for something to do, and I, meanwhile, you know, outside my window is boom, boom, boom from thunder, you know, thunderstorms were producing lightning. So I thought, well, is there anything I can do with lightning? So I contacted uh, some researchers at the University of Florida and they said, yeah, come on over, we can trigger lightning and you can set up your x-ray detectors. So these are my x-ray detectors. They're inside these white boxes or Faraday cages, these things like are like a 100-pound Faraday cage around these uh, sodium iodide detectors. So these measure good at measuring x-rays. They're shielded, use fiber optics, batteries, so they're really good Faraday cages. And this tower here has tubes that contain rockets. So these rockets are about that tall. If you've ever done model rocketry, you'd recognize all the parts and pieces as a parachute. And instead of a sort of typical model rocket engine, they use like, I think, H engines. Engines are about that big. The main difference between these rockets and model rocketry is it has a spool of Kevlar-coated copper wire at the bottom. 
So when we uh, launch the rocket, so there's a thunderstorm overhead. You know lightning's going to strike anyway. If you're going to strike anyway, why don't you go and strike here now? And you launch the rocket. Rocket goes up, and the wire comes off the spool as the rocket goes up. And very quickly, you have a few hundred meters of copper wire hanging in the air. So that wire will enhance the, there's a thunderstorm field around you. So that wire will enhance the field, kind of like a finger to the doorknob. And you'll, you'll initiate a spark off the tip of the wire in the rocket. That's called a leader. That leader will then follow the field lines, sometimes miles and miles, and will find the thunderstorm charge center, sometimes many miles away. Not even, sometimes it'll be blue sky overhead. And it'll find the thunderstorm charge field. The lightning will then follow that channel back down and then strike the tower here. And you've got this wire up here as a strike point. Okay, so it's the idea you launch the rocket, you give it a place to strike. So it's real lightning. You're just giving it a place to strike. So I've got some movies here. So you can recognize, so here's the rocket tubes here, here's the top of the tower. Let me just go back. So here's the, here's the, uh, yeah, I lost my pointer here. So here's the tubes right here you're going to see in the next one. Okay, so we're going to launch the rocket. Three, two, one, fire. Let's do that in slow motion. I think a lot of physicists choose this field because we secretly like blowing things up. <laughs> This definitely satisfies that. <laughs> so that's how we trigger lightning. Of course, that is one way to do it. There is another way of triggering lightning. We call this the graduate student method. <laughs> that's not a real picture, by the way. I have no idea where that picture came from, actually. OK, so thunderstorms overhead, you launch the rocket, you get real lightning that comes down, and now you know where to set your detectors. X-rays don't go very far through the air. You need to be close. And this is one reason that this hadn't been really investigated before. If you're just going to set a detector up in a top of a building, you can wait a long time before lightning's close enough to actually measure the X-rays. And if he happens to get close enough, it's hard to verify. You know, It's hard to replicate. And so if you look back through the history in this field, people have been trying to decide, does lightning produce x-rays? They've been trying to decide this since about 1930. And up until 2001, nobody really knew the answer to this. And so what did we find when we did this? So well, here's a picture of lightning. Here's the, this is the top of the tower and the tubes. Here's the lightning. This is actually this green part. That's the wire exploding. It's actually really bright when it explodes. And here's all the lightning strokes. So what do you see? Well, this is basically the oscilloscope output. Okay, you, we hook up an oscilloscope to the anode of a photomultiplier tube. This is what you would see with a radioactive source. Just for, this is what the pulse would look like. And here's what you get from lightning. So this time zero is the time of the bright stroke, when the brightest part of lightning. This is the time when the lightning is propagating down to the ground, about ready to attach. Each one of these pulses is a burst of x-rays. In fact, you can measure the energy quite nicely. And you see they get brighter and brighter, and they get burst, burst, burst. It gets brighter and brighter, then saturates the uh, detector. These are not small signals. These are, I mean, this, this is just straight into the, from the anode. I mean, these are one volt signal. These are not little pulses that you're trying to tease out of the background. These are saturate your detector kind of signals. And so we thought, well, okay, that's cool. Will it do it again? And so we did, shot another rocket and made same x-rays. Well, maybe we got a light leak. We wrapped it up in this and that, went over with strobe lights, did it again. Same x-rays. We did this all summer long, and by we eventually published this in Science. And after we were before this, nobody believed that x-rays were produced by lightning. And after this, everybody knew it. So this was uh, back in uh, the first uh, results uh, were back in 2003. We can also see x-rays from uh, natural lightning. Every once in a while we get lucky, there'll be a nearby natural lightning. 
This shows the electric field. These little, this big spike here is the bright part of the lightning, the return stroke. These little spikes here is as the lightning is propagating down, it produces little pulses. These are the x-rays. This is just the raw signal coming out of the detector. So you get all these little spikes here, that's a burst of x-rays. And these are kind of 100 keV, MeV kind of x-rays, hard x-rays. And just to get a sense for what the background is, after the return stroke happens, the electric field collapses and you just, the show's over. You can see the background level, there's nothing. You know, in these detectors, the count rate's like it may be 100 counts a second in the background, and this time scale is a millisecond. So at most you'd expect to see, you'd have a one in 10 probability of getting one background pulse in there. And so you can see there's a lot of x-rays produced by lightning. It's really amazing that, you know, just recently we figured this out. Okay, so meanwhile, back inside the thunderstorm. So what can this do for us in terms of terrestrial gamma ray flashes? Well, Lightning can make lots of x-rays. Where they come from, it's producing runaway electrons. And we think how that's happening is the electric field at the tip is so large, you can basically accelerate. Any free electron you have will just be accelerated up to almost the speed of light. That's how strong the electric fields are. So now we have a source of these energetic electrons which can seed these avalanches. So rather than having a cosmic ray seed the avalanche, well, maybe lightning is doing it. So you have lightning propagating through the thunderstorm makes a lot of seed particles, energetic electrons, a little bit energetic. They then accelerate, gain more energy, avalanche multiply, and make the terrestrial gamma ray flash. So this is one of the main models now for explaining terrestrial gamma ray flashes. If this model is correct, then what these spacecraft are seeing is they're actually seeing lightning and gamma rays being sort of blasting their way up through the atmosphere. And they're seeing this from up to 1,000 kilometers away. So that lightning's pretty bright in gamma rays, if this is right. Now there is an alternate explanation. And this is so-called relativistic feedback. Another name, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So here's another idea of how you might make terrestrial gamma ray flashes. It's a competing mechanism. And so I'm gonna show you, this again is a Monte Carlo simulation. It should look familiar now. I'm gonna inject one electron here. It will avalanche multiply just like the previous slides I showed. And there's that blue positron coming down. Gamma rays are produced, they pair produce, they make positrons which run away down. The thing about the positrons is they can kick out more energetic electrons and produce more electrons that can then run away. So you start getting secondary avalanches, which then make more gamma rays, more positrons, more secondary avalanches. So you get sort of an exponential growth of avalanches. It's a, it's a positive feedback effect. Positrons make electrons, which make positrons, which make electrons, and the whole thing keeps growing and growing. So these three panels, this is what it looks like inside a thunderstorm after a half a microsecond. This is what the picture looks like after two microseconds, and this is what the picture looks like after 10 microseconds. So all these secondary avalanches are made internally by this feedback effect. It's just like taking a microphone and sticking it up to the speaker. It just gets louder and louder and louder. And you'll keep growing until eventually you have so much ionization, so many high energy particles and so much ionization that the field will just collapse. And then that will end the event. And of course you will, you will produce a very large burst of gamma rays. And let me skip that. We can actually model how this would work. This is with a PIC code. And this is kind of what it would look like if you actually could see inside the thunderstorm. This shows what the ambient electric field would look like. There's a positive charge center, a negative charge center, so lighter colors or bigger fields. When this feedback discharge happens, it doesn't happen uniformly in space. It tends to happen in this finger that races down, and this is where all the ionization is. So this is the part of the thunderstorm that's discharged. So we can self-consistently model all this. Does the model do anything reasonable? Let me show you three examples. So these are three terrestrial gamma ray flashes seen by the BATSI instrument. And sometimes terrestrial gamma ray flashes have these weird multiple pulses, like a big, wide, fat first pulse, then almost like a ringing of gamma ray pulses. So each one of these pulses here is a, is a burst of MEV gamma rays. And you can see several examples that same, show the same structure. When you run this self-consistent model of, with relativistic feedback, it naturally produces pulses 
and naturally produces this kind of shape, a big wide fat first pulse followed by a ringing with about the right time scale and the right number of gamma rays. So that sure looks like those to me. And so I think the model is doing something reasonable, at least for the multipulse events. We can also use the same models and find out other things about the terrestrial gamma ray flashes. So I have colleagues at NRL who have a nice version of JONT called SWORD that can model things like 737s. What would happen if you were in seat 17B and you were hit by a terrestrial gamma ray flash? We can combine those models of the mass models of the aircraft with these simulations. And the answer is if you were flying in an aircraft, end up inside a thunderstorm, which does happen sometimes, and one of these terrestrial gamma ray flashes went off, you would get about the equivalent of a whole body CT scan in less than a millisecond. So not super scary, but not everyone wants to have a full body CT scan. And so it's something to, you know, I would, I would not, I would, I would not drive instead of fly for fear of terrestrial gamma ray flashes, but it's just something that needs to be looked into more. So this all, a lot of these results, results were put together and, uh, and published, there's an article in GRL that came out. And th another name for these relativistic feedback discharges is dark lightning. The idea is you'll get very large current pulses produced by this. Uh, some of the largest current pulses coming from the thunderstorm, and yet it will discharge big volumes of the thunderstorm and produce almost no optical emission. So you would see in radio a big, um, a big signal coming out, a big discharge in the thunderstorm, but if you looked, you would not see anything because it's all gamma rays coming out, very little optical emission. So this whole process is nicknamed dark lightning. It's actually, it's, the name dark lightning has a long history in this field. Uh, it was originally uh, referred to, it's called the, it refers to the, what's called the Clayton effect. If you look at really old photographic plates of lightning, sometimes there'll be, the channel will look actually dark. It's just a, it's how the photographic emulsion works. It's a photo effect with the uh, photograph. And so it was called dark lightning. Of course, that's not physical, but the, this idea using this name is this is another way that thunderstorms can discharge that produces little optical emission. And this was the cover of GRL. You may, this is not actually a photograph of dark lightning. If you remember my first slide of lightning, it's the photographic negative of that first slide, just for fun. Okay, last topic I wanted to tell you about. There's one other thing that thunderstorms do that's kind of cool. So-called gamma ray glows. So thunderstorms can sort of produce this big spasm of gamma rays that come out very, very bright, so bright that you can blind spacecraft in low Earth orbit. But they also can do something else. They can produce kind of a soft glow of gamma rays that can last at least minutes long, uh, maybe longer. <laughs> So thunderstorms, you know, you, you, if there's a thunderstorm outside during the summer, you look up, imagine it can be just sort of continuously glowing in gamma rays. And to study these gamma ray glows, we, I was collaborating with uh, UC Santa Cruz, uh, David Smith and others there, and we had an instrument called a Dell, which flew on a Gulfstream 5. This is a, an in-car NSF research aircraft. And we were flying this around, trying to measure gamma ray glows, and if we got lucky, TGFs. And this actually shows some examples of as we flew past thunderstorms. You would see sort of this background, and you'd see these enhancements. These, we'd see these as we'd fly past thunderstorms. So as we went past it, the detectors would light up, and as we went away, they, uh, we wouldn't see it anymore. So these flights were back in 2009, and they actually decided to fly uh, NCAR decided to fly out of Melbourne, Florida, which is where Florida Tech was. It's just a coincidence that they were flying out, chose to fly out of the airport that was like four miles from my house. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm part of this project and they needed people to, we, you know, we needed people on the aircraft to help with the instrument. And I really don't like flying all that much, but I mean, how many chances do you get to do something like this? So, okay, I'll go on this, go on these flights. And so 
We, we took off and we flew around. The idea is they don't get too close to thunderstorms. Thunderstorms are really dangerous. You know, they had to stay like at least 10 kilometers away from the thunderstorms. They'd fly past and they'd go around. And it was great. The, uh, these Gulfstream 5s have really large windows. And this thing flies really high. It's up I think, like 43,000 feet. And so it's just beautiful. You can kind of look down the sides of these giant thunderstorm towers. You know, you're kind of, you know, you're staring down 40,000 feet on these faces. It's just really cool. And so and it was really it was really smooth. We were outside the storms. It was smooth. It was nice. I'm really liking this. And so we uh, landed. I thought, great, I'm all excited. So the next flight, I volunteered to go on that one, too. And it was the same. It was really fun. I really liked it. Next flight was not such a good, didn't go so well. So this is what happened on my last flight on the Gulfstream 5. So there are a lot of thunderstorms. Here's where all the lightning was. So the Gulf Stream 5 is flying along here, comes, does this big loop around, goes that way, and flew right through the convective core of a thunderstorm on accident. Okay, I think what they say is the, the radar, they looked at what they thought was the coast of Georgia, but it was actually a line of thunderstorms, and we flew right through the middle of it. <laughs> I really thought I was going to die during this. The plane started, well, I mean, it, most of the time when you're, um, when you feel turbulence in a plane, it's fairly like high frequency bumps, like, you know, maybe a jerk. This was very low frequency. This was like plane going back and forth like this and then down. And so we were, I, I, we were I, they say we're going at most 20 degrees, but it really felt like we were going all the way around. Because your, your inner ear starts going crazy. So you can't tell what's up. All you know is you're moving back and forth like this. So we're going back and forth like this. I think we're going around like this. And I definitely can tell that we were going down like this. So we dropped 3,000 feet fairly quickly while I'm thinking we're barrel rolling. So I thought we were barrel rolling into the ground. As far as I could tell, that's what we were doing. And so I'm holding onto the seat with my eyes closed, okay, and we're doing this, but then suddenly the grad student who thinks this is really fun, <laughs> lets out a yell that we suddenly start getting all kinds of great gamma ray data, and so it's like, what, what, you know, <laughs> so I went from, you know, from complete terror to excitement as we're barrel rolling down, we're getting this great data. So we went through this thing and everything was okay in the end. So we got on the ground. So what did we see? So this is the sort of the moments of terror going through the thunderstorm. We started seeing these spikes of gamma rays. Uh, so these are gamma ray glows. And we actually flew through the source region of one of these gamma ray glows. We actually flew through one of these electron beams I've been showing you over and over again and got really good measurements of it. And so that was really cool. And I can give you a whole talk on that. But I want to finish with these three little pulses right here. So there's three of them there. And we triggered on two. So I can only show you two of them. And so those are what I want to talk about. And here's what we saw with those. So here's the first one. Here's the second one. So this shows the electric field data. So we started discharging. We were going through a high field region here. And you can see the count rates go up. So both of them are very similar and plotted them on top of each other. So you see that we went through these little glow regions inside the thunderstorm. But here's what's weird. We can do an energy spectrum. So this is a sodium iodide detector, has fairly good energy response. This shows one second of data and the energy of all the gamma rays we measured. So right there is that glow. And all of the particles are 511. 511 is the energy, the annihilation energy of a positron. So when you have a positron and it annihilates with an electron, you get two 511 keV gamma rays that come out. And then we measured those. All this stuff below is just the Compton scattered 511, and there's nothing above. So this was like a pure source of 511 that suddenly turned on and suddenly turned off. In fact, we can do a... We can do a, a little energy spectrum so you can see this. So this shows the 511. We can fit the detector response. We can do a little bit of modeling. Our best guess is we found ourselves in a cloud of positrons, about 18 curies of positrons. We're suddenly surrounding the aircraft. They suddenly appeared. And then a 0.2 seconds later, it disappeared. I really have no good explanation for this. 
In fact, we saw it in 2009. It took me five years to have the guts to publish it because uh, I had no reasonable explanation for how where these positrons came from. Um, so I published it. I had a few suggestions. None of them were very satisfactory. And actually, this last year, another group flying another instrument with another aircraft saw the same thing flying through a thunderstorm. So this is uh, observationally, this has been validated. All right, so let me wrap it up. So basically the story is thunderstorms are strange places. They do a lot of really interesting stuff. They produce a lot of high energy emissions. Um, they uh, produce positron clouds, whatever the heck those are. They glow in gamma rays. They occasionally produce these very powerful terrestrial gamma ray flashes, which can then make these terrestrial electron beams that can be seen thousands of miles away by spacecraft. X-rays also being produced by lightning. X-rays are very bright in lightning. And this also a mechanism for explaining all this could be a new type of electrical discharge, which has been nicknamed dark lightning. So all this together is really new stuff that it's been happening and all this has become part of a new field which is called high energy atmospheric physics. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Dark lightning is different from the regular lightning we see. Correct. So they happen at the same time, yes. different time or different conditions. Both probably. So we know that terrestrial gamma. So if dark lightning is correct, then terrestrial gamma ray flashes are a byproduct of dark lightning. One way of triggering dark lightning is to have normal lightning push the electric field up high enough so you get it. So what if there was normal lightning going on, it would be producing some light. Then in the middle, you get a you get a very large current spike with no additional light being produced. Or alternatively, sometimes maybe it's produced without any lightning at all. We don't know about that yet. So these are interesting features. Do they play any role in like a larger scale picture of say the energy of the upper atmosphere or are they just kind of interesting features? Um, it's hard to say. We know in terms of like um, chemical reactions, um, ionization. Yeah, it's probably not the high energy particle is probably not so important in terms of the ionosphere. Of course a lot okay, well one way it, it could affect the ionosphere is when a terrestrial gamma fla ray flash goes off, then the current pulse that it produces is so large that you can make an elf over overhead, these rings of light. So that will perturb the ionosphere. So not, not directly from the gamma rays going up, but the gamma rays and interject electrons in the cloud itself can produce such a large current pulse that it could affect things. We have uh, probably billions of flashes of lightning per day. Right. What percentage of those? Are yeah, that's a good question. So, what, what's the fraction? How much? How many times you get terrestrial gamma ray flashes compared to lightning? Our best guess is maybe one in a thousand. Uh, for every thousand lightning flashes, you will have a terrestrial gamma ray flash. That's based on spacecraft observations. You sort of look at how much of the world you can see underneath the spacecraft at any time. You count up how many you get. You sort of infer what you would get over the planet, then compare that to lightning uh, flash rates. And the number one in a thousand uh, comes up. But it, it's really a hard number to pin down. When we do aircraft observations, we don't see nearly so many. And we're, it's a little confusing reconciling it with the space spacecraft as possible that the aircrafts are not flying over the optimal thunderstorms. Work in progress, basically. Yeah? So when you're inputting like, the electric field into the simulation, yeah. is it uh, like some sort of averaging of measured values? Uh, the so you mean how do we choose what electric field? So these are the large scale electric fields that we put in. Um, you can put in our best guess for what the thunderstorm's doing. So we have a rough idea what the charge 
charges are inside a thunderstorm. So if I was modeling this, I might put in, okay, a 30 Coulomb positive charge region that extends a mile or so, and then a, you know, a, so many Coulombs of negative charge, and then just calculate using Poisson's equation the electric field. So we do the best we can just based upon what we know about thunderstorms, but then as the discharges progress and charge gets moves around, moved around, we keep recalculating the electric field. Yeah. What sort of electric fields are they at the tip of the lightning bolt that causes these electrons to go around? Yeah, so we, um, we think that the so-called critical field is being produced. And so at sea level, it's about 30 million volts per meter, which is about 10 times the conventional breakdown field. So like if you, you, know, you, you go and touch a doorknob, somewhere between your finger and the doorknob, you reach about 3 million volts per meter in that gap. So the critical field's 10 times larger than that. And then you start making energetic radiation. So, so can you simulate this in a lab? Uh, yes, actually. Um, so shortly after we figured out that lightning makes... Uh, makes x-rays, I, I started giving talks about this. And I'd say, therefore, lightning is different than a spark in the lab because everyone knows that sparks in the labs don't make x-rays. I mean, you know, x-rays are hard to make. You need vacuums to make x-rays, not in air. And I kept saying that. And I said, well, how do I actually know that? Because it wasn't too long ago that everyone knew lightning didn't make x-rays. So we took the same instruments up to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where they have a large Marx generator. They, they can make one and a half million volt sparks about that long. We set up the detectors next to it and made x-rays just like the lightning. So yeah, laboratory sparks can do it as well. Actually, we took the same instruments over to the Boston Museum of Science where they have the world's largest air insulated Van de Graaff machine, huge thing. And uh, we sparked all day long. Not a single x-ray came out of that thing. And so had, not all laboratory sparks make x-rays. They have to be kind of a high current, really, really powerful discharge. So yeah, they are they are studied now in the lab. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go? Okay. Uh, so you showed some of the satellite data from instruments that's not meant for this purpose. Is astronomical? Is there uh, any instrument, maybe a satellite that you would really like to have that you think would help this research, or is it largely theoretical? Well, yeah, that's a really good point. So every instrument that has made a measurement so far is not designed to measure this. In fact, they badly saturate. You get pulse pilot, dead time effects, and it's they're just not well suited for these kind of measurements. There is an instrument that is going to launch next month called AWESOME. It's going to go on the space station. It's being built uh, by the Europeans. And it is designed to measure terrestrial gamma ray flashes. There's going to be another instrument uh, on Tyrannus, which is another satellite that's going to be launched in a couple years. So there's a, a few ones. They're not big instruments, but they're, we're starting to get, get some that are at least better designed for this. Yeah. Yeah, so people, so what about the atmospheric chemistry? Um, it, there will be an impact locally, but you know, you can calculate how many energetic particles there are. Uh, locally, there will be an impact there, but globally, not so much. I don't think it would be measurable, as far as we know. Yeah. Is there anything to be gained by studying this phenomenon, this polarized light, and an X-ray polarization? Uh, you're so for the, polarized, the X-ray polarization? Yeah, actually my graduate student is working on, he's about ready to submit a paper where we've done a theoretical study of this. And for terrestrial gamma ray flashes, it's not possible. You, you, the level of polarization you'd expect is about 10%. And there's just not enough photons detected to actually measure that. So terrestrial gamma ray flashes, unfortunately, polarization um, is not useful. You can sometimes see these terrestrial gamma ray flashes on the ground. Sometimes the thunderstorm will beam them down. There you can potentially measure the polarization. Again, it's like around the 10% level. But actually, there's not a lot to be gained in terms of the information that you get. It's not like in, um, look at, you know, it's not like uh, looking at, uh, 
uh, astrophysical sources where you can get information. You know, so basically, you can learn about the geometry of the source by looking at the polarization. There's so much scattering going on, you're really just seeing local effects. It might be something for the X-ray some lightning. You could actually, I think, get some information about the source by looking at the polarization, but it's a tough measurement to make. <laughs> The inter the energy spectrum of the X rays and yeah. gamma rays. Yeah, yeah. So for yeah, so for uh, lightning, natural and triggered lightning, the energy these are hard X rays. The average energy is a few hundred keV. The spectrum extends up to maybe a few MeV. Typically, it's below an MeV, but you know, a few hundred keV. So these are hard X rays. The trustal gamma ray flash. The uh, these are multi MeV gamma rays. The spectrum extends; it's exponential, but extends up to maybe 40 or 50 MeV. So these are pretty uh, energetic gamma rays. Yeah. Would you expect to see this effect on other planets like Jupiter? Use it to say something about the atmosphere of other planets. Yeah, so the, I, I published a paper a few years ago looking at all the physics of runaway electrons in a hydrogen helium atmosphere. And actually, uh, the Jovian atmosphere would work better for this. It's the, you have, you have lower Z um, um, atoms, and so there's actually less scattering. So the, the gas is a little more slippery in terms of the runaway electrons. So they sh it should all work really well in, uh, hydrogen helium atmosphere. So you should get lots of runaway electrons. And Jovian atmospheres, they produce thunderstorms. They're water ice thunderstorms, not too different from Earth's. And so, you know, if you have big thunderstorms in Jupiter, which must be producing big electric fields, it's probably producing runaway electrons like we get here on Earth. Now, the problem with Jupiter is here on Earth, you have not so much atmosphere. You have maybe um, 200 grams of atmosphere between the top of the thunderstorm or the gamma ray source in space. On Jupiter, the thunderstorms are deeper, so you have about one bar worth of atmosphere between the thunderstorm and space. And of course, then the spacecraft are farther away too. So I, it'd be pretty hard if the, you get the same number of gamma rays as on Earth in Jupiter, they wouldn't make it out of the atmosphere. But of course, Jupiter makes really big lightning, so maybe it makes larger versions of these. We really don't know. Should I keep going or? Okay. You just tell me when to stop. Okay. <laughs> um, you said that there was a lot of liter literature published about trying to explain how gamma ray flashes came from sprites, yeah. but they weren't. Right. So, do you have any idea? where they were going wrong, or any wrong assumptions. A lot of it was wishful thinking, I think. It's, you know, in hindsight, it's very clear. Well, okay, here's the basic problem. So the way you get a sprite is that thunderstorms make a really big electric field. And if you suddenly discharge the field here, the field will pop up up here. It's kind of like stepping on a bump in a carpet. You step on the bump here, the bump pops up someplace else. And so you end up getting a, a strong electric field near the top of the atmosphere, at least strong enough to create a discharge. So you get a conventional discharge, and that's the sprite. Now, if you look at what kind of potentials you get, though, the potentials are not that impressive. You don't get the hundreds of millions of volts that you need to make the runaway electrons. You get a big field, but not a big potential. And so it, in order to get the kind of potentials that you need, the, poten the hundreds of millions of volts, you need like a monster lightning, bigger than has really almost ever seen. And so it's just like they were kind of ignoring that problem with the models and just sort of you know, just kept going and going and going with the models without ever really addressing that basic difficulty. And then later, when we actually did measurements, we can see that it's just a little lightning that's making it, not these monster ones you would need. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.